So we're going to wrap up this, this uh, series. It's also part of our membership series here at Bay Point called Everybody. And we started this in early June with a message called Everybody's Invited because the gospel is for who? It's for everybody. So everybody's invited. And then we talked about how not only is everybody invited, but everybody is included. So we need to be clear that the church is not just for church people. The church is for people people. And then last week, we talked about how everybody is important. Every single person who has given their life to Jesus Christ has unique abilities and gifts that are an important part of fulfilling God's redemptive purposes in the world. And so today, today is really about, it's about making a commitment. It's about individually and collectively saying, I'm in. So we're calling today, move from everybody's invited to everybody's Included to everybody's important. Today is called Everybody In. And you're going to have to answer that, what that means, um, you know, in the course of the next few minutes together. So let me pray and we'll dive into the message. Father, I would pray as, as was, as Tori prayed earlier, God, that your spirit would move in this service. I pray, God, that for those of us who came with low expectations, or really maybe no expectations at all, that somehow, someway in these next moments, your Holy Spirit would move and speak and motivate and transform and bring us to that point, God, where we see clearly that now is the time. Not tomorrow, not next week. Now is the time to make commitments, to answer the question, am I in? And what does that mean? So speak to us now, we pray in Jesus' name. And everybody who agreed said, amen. amen. Speaking of everybody in, um, I, I, I told the story some years ago when I first did this series. And when I was a little kid, before I moved to Rochester Hills, the north suburb of Detroit, I grew up in St. Clair Shores, the east side of Detroit. In our backyard, we had a 24-foot round above-ground pool. And uh, we, used, we used to love swimming in that pool. Um, but the pool, uh, it, while it had a ledge on it, it wasn't intended to be stood on. But we would do it anyway because we didn't know. We were like six or seven or eight years old. And we'd get like 12 people on it. And we'd do the one, two, three jump. Because if you jump by yourself, you made what kind of splash? A little splash, right? But you get 12 people or more all jumping at the same time, you make what kind of splash? And it's more fun to make a big splash, isn't it? Now, if, if you weren't here four years ago when we first did this, here's like a little outtake of what happened. So take a look at the side screen. What we were concerned about is getting a dozen kids all around the pool, and we would do that. And I, I can't really do this, but imagine I'm on the edge of the pool, and we do the one, two, three, jump. <laughs> oh. Okay. Let's use the 11 o'clock tape this week. <laughs> okay. One, two, three. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes when you jump, you crash and burn. You know, you do. And that, that's the big fear is that, you know, what will happen? We imagine these worst case scenarios, but here's the deal, folks. I believe that God is saying to many of us who are on the ledge, on the fence, in the stands, playing it safe, when are you going to jump? You know, it's, it's time. It's time for you and for me to get off the ledge and get into the water. It might be a little scary. Maybe you need floaties. That's okay. But at some point, you've got to get in. It's time. So let me ask you, seriously, I want you to wrestle with this. What are you waiting for? This is your life. It's my life. It's the only life we get. This is our time, friends, to make a splash for the gospel of Jesus Christ in the lives of friends and family and people that we know and love who don't have any meaning or purpose or hope in their life. A couple weeks ago when Mike's staff talked on Father's Day, one of the assignments he gave us, if, if you weren't here, you should go onto our podcast, bponline.org, and watch that message. But Mike said one of the things he, he challenged us to do was to write 
our obituary. Now, I don't know how many of you took that seriously. He said, write the obituary that you think people would actually say about you, and then write the one that you would hope they would say about you. And as I was thinking about that, I was reading through the book of Acts, and I came to this summary statement of the life of one of Israel's great leaders, their greatest king ever, King David. And in Acts chapter 13, uh, verse 36, I came upon this statement. It said, David served God's purposes in his generation. And then the verse goes on to say, and then he died. And I thought, if somebody put that on my tombstone, that Nick served God's purposes in his generation, and then he died, I would be a happy camper. I would be absolutely thrilled. So think about this. Everybody in. Make a splash. Make a difference. Make a mess if you have to, but do something. All of that sounds inspiring and exciting on a Sunday morning. But then reality sets in and life gets busy and the vision of a su- uh, that burns in our heart on a Sunday often fades upon the pressures of Monday. And for many of us, the dream of jumping in with a bunch of other people and making a big splash for God, it's it's an ideal that so often does not get lived out. And part of it is because we have this idea that it's as exciting as it may be, it's unreachable for a mere mortal like me. I'm just a regular Joe or Sally or Sue or whatever. I mean, maybe for the spiritual superstars like Moses or David or the Apostle Paul, but me? So let, let, me, let me tell you a story, give you an illustration of what this idea of jumping in individually and collectively and making a difference for the kingdom of God, for the cause of Christ. Let me tell you what it looks like. This past week, my wife Rose and I sat down, we watched a documentary. The documentary is called The Way We Get By. Anybody here seen it? Nobody. Wow. It was a real hit. Okay, the way we get by, I highly recommend it. It's about a group of senior citizens, and we're going to bring their photos up here. Their names are Bill, Joan, and Jerry. I don't know how clear that is, but that's Bill on the right, that's Jerry, uh, and uh, that's Joan. Now, these are three people, retirees who live in Bangor, Maine. What I found out in the video, in the uh, documentary, is that 90% of the troops, the U.S. troops, that leave and come back, leave for Iraq and Afghanistan and return, 90% of them come through the airport in Bangor, Maine. These three retirees began to go to the airport and they networked and they got a whole bunch of other people to make sure that every single departing and returning soldier was greeted and thanked for their service to our country. And oftentimes, these trips took them to the airport in the wee hours of the morning. They've been doing this since 2003. The documentary was shot in 2009. Rose and I cried through a good part of the documentary. By 2009, they had, they had greeted and thanked over 700,000 U.S. soldiers. Now, let me, let me read the description that I took off uh, uh, online. This is an online description of the documentary. It says, This moving documentary profiles the personal stories of Bill, Joan, and Jerry and the impact they've made on countless lives as they share their kindness and support through handshakes and high fives. How many of you are capable of handshakes and high fives? Show of hands. Yeah, unless you're paralyzed from the neck down. Okay, you, you can do that. As they share their kindness and support through handshakes and high fives, these compassionate greeters strengthen their community, their country, and themselves. That's what I'm talking about, folks, in terms of making a splash. These are simple and yet profound acts of kindness and generosity and compassion to touch the lives of these soldiers who serve our country. And given the fact that this is Fourth of July weekend, and I have another story about this in a moment, the fact that this is Fourth of July weekend, may we never forget that freedom is not free. It comes at a price. And so just for a moment, I would be honored, I think we would all be, if those of you, men, women, past or present, who have ever served our country uh, in our military, would you all please stand so we can just acknowledge you? Would you please stand? Thank you, guys. Thank you.
thank you so much for, for what you've done, the sacrifice that you've made, time away from family, and so forth. But I, the reason I, I was so moved by that documentary, well, it was in and of itself, it was a great story, but it got me thinking, this is what it means to make a splash. Three retirees, and their story is compelling because in, in some ways they think they're past their time. They don't have any purpose in life, and yet they go to the airport and they give hope and encouragement and thanks to these people. They're influencing tens of thousands of people, and I thought, that's what it means. That's what you and I have the potential of doing through simple acts of kindness and generosity and encouragement. We can point tens of thousands of people in our sphere of influence to the one who is the way and the truth and the life. My question is, are you in? I don't know what that means for you. What role? We talked about that last week. Are you an ear? Are you an elbow? Are you a big toe? I don't know. We'll figure that out. But it starts with a fundamental commitment at the heart level. Are you in? Do you want to be part of something extraordinary and eternal? In asking that question, I know I'm touching on two huge realities. One is that there is a deep need in the human soul, a deep longing to belong. We want to belong. That's why people join fraternities and sororities. It's why people join civic groups or the military or peace groups. It's why people endure horrific beatings and even torture to become part of a gang. Because the need to belong is that deep. On the other hand, as much as we long to belong, there's also a huge, what I have called a huge growing commitment phobia that has affected our culture. We want to belong, but we're afraid to commit for fear of being let down and betrayed or abandoned or taken advantage of. And I get that because I've seen people commit, and I've seen hearts broken. I've seen business relationships fall apart. I've seen marriage relationships fall apart. I've seen church relationships fall apart. So it's tempting to keep our relationships safe and casual to avoid any possibility of hurt or pain or disappointment, the kind where Nobody gets hurt. The problem with that is it does not satisfy the deepest longing of our soul. If you play it safe and keep everybody at arm's length, you will not experience that which you need more than anything else in life. And that is love. The giving and the receiving of love. You cannot love from a distance. Love by its nature involves proximity, intimacy, and risk. Anybody who has ever loved knows love is risky business. And nobody knows that more than God. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And we all know, at least most of us know, what the world did to the Son of God. Love is risky business. Love, by the way, requires commitment. You want to know how the Bible spells love? C-O-M-M-I-T-M-E-N-T. Love and commitment are inseparable. The question is, since love is so risky, is it worth the risk for you to commit, knowing that in addition to the glory, uh, there's pain along the way? Now, I want to shift gears and I want to talk about a level of love that is tied to a a special kind of commitment. And there's a very special word that the Bible uses, and we're going to get into God's word here. And the word is covenant. Would you say that with me? Covenant. Now, covenant is one of the primary themes that weaves its way through the whole Bible. I would go so far as to say you cannot understand the big global story of the Bible without understanding the basic concept of covenant. So I want to begin by defining what a covenant is not. A covenant is not a contract. A contract is something between two parties where you sit down, one, two, three, you negotiate, you get all the language right, you sign it, and as long as you live according to the terms of the uh, the contract, you're okay, but if somebody breaks the contract, you know, things fall apart, lawsuits are filed, and all of that stuff. A good friend of mine told me a a story about a guy who has sold his company And then as part of the terms of sale, he had to sign a a non-compete contract, meaning he could not uh, start a business in the uh, the same city doing the same thing. He signed the contract. 
But then a year down the road, he decided he wanted to go back into that business, even though he had signed a contract saying he couldn't. So he took it to an attorney, and an attorney found this loophole, that loophole. They took it to court. The judge ruled in favor of the guy, and he got out of the contract. And he boasted about how, because of legalese and loopholes, he got out of his contract, and he bragged about it. We ought never do that, friends. Our word, as followers of Jesus, should be our bond. But see, a covenant's deeper. A covenant isn't so much about words on paper as it is the motivated direction of the heart. It, a covenant is a permanent binding agreement that is anchored in a committed loving relationship between two parties. A covenant is normally initiated and inaugurated by the greater in the party, and then it is validated by the lesser. And covenants, and you'll see this in the Bible in a moment, covenants are normally sealed by some outward sign. Modern day example of a covenant is marriage. It's not a contract. It's a till death do us part covenant. In our culture, what is the typical sign, the outward sign of the inner covenant of the heart? Anybody? Wedding rings. That's right. Now, this is, this, this is an outward sign that points to an inward reality. When we were preparing this, uh, somebody told me a story about, another military story, about two battle buddies. True story. And they, they made a covenant that if one of them got hurt, the other would not leave them behind. That's part of our military tradition in our government anyway. But uh, this one guy's battle buddy, his closest friend, got shot, and he was uh, lying, bleeding right in the middle of an open battle, and for his friend to go to him was really to, for him to risk his life, but he went anyway. And in the process of going out to save his buddy, he got shot. So now you got these two guys lying and bleeding to death on the battlefield, and the first friend who was shot looked at his buddy and said, I knew you would come. How did he know that? Covenant. Ed and Pat Fouch, the colonel, Colonel Ed Fouch and his bride, P Patsy, who is my assistant here at Bay Point. They made a marriage covenant 45 years ago. But it wasn't just a covenant to be faithful to each other. It was a covenant to raise their children in a godly manner. One of their children, a son named Chad, was a total care child who was about as retarded as a human being could be. He had the intellectual development of a three-month-old. Chad required Pat's constant care, needing to be fed every four hours around the clock every single day of his life. And, and Patsy did it. When he died in Patsy's arms, just shy of his 20th birthday, he weighed 48 pounds. And Patsy told me herself, she said it was an honor, an honor to be Chad's mother. And I would do it all over again. That is one of many reasons why Ed and Pat are among my list of heroes that I've had the privilege of knowing in my life. I want to be clear about this idea of covenant. We are not talking about a sort of, I'll love you and care for you as long as it's easy or convenient. I'm talking now about an I love you and I will care for you, period. No matter the cost. And the Bible is full of covenants like this. There was a covenant that God made with Noah. Some of you know about it. Big flood, ark, you know the story? If you don't, you can read about it in Genesis chapter 9. And then God made a promise. He made a covenant, promise to Noah. He said, I'll never flood the earth and destroy the world through a flood again, at least not the whole world. And what was the outward sign of the covenant? It was a, a rainbow. In Genesis 17, we read about um, one of several covenants that God made with Abraham. But in this covenant, it was that Abraham's descendants would multiply and, and bless the entire world. That covenant started in Genesis chapter 12. But the sign of that covenant was circumcision, which is practiced to this day among Jewish people. There's a covenant that you can read about in Exodus chapter 20, a covenant God made with his people Israel through Moses. And the promise, God's promise in this covenant is he would be their God and he would lead and guide them. And Israel's, Israel's terms of the covenant was to obey these ten commands that God had given them. And the sign of that covenant that sealed it and ratified it was the stone tablets. 
Now, there are numerous covenants recorded in the Bible, but I want to back up from Genesis 17 to Genesis 15 and read a very unusual covenant that God made with, uh, with Abraham. And I, I need to ask you, if I don't, I, I, I might regret it. So I'm going to ask you, if you started to tack off, if you're in the middle of texting, stop all that and dial in. Give me your best, all right, guys? Give me your best attention now because this is so important. In Genesis 15, God renews a covenant made earlier in Genesis chapter 12 to bless Abraham with descendants, but now in this covenant, as he's restating it, he also makes a promise to give Abraham and his descendants land. Descendants and land. The problem is, especially when it comes to the descendants, Abraham is 99 years old. Any 99-year-olds here who have fathered a child lately? Are there any 99-year-old men here? Okay, but, but as we learn in the Bible, with God, how, how much is possible? All things are possible. Now, bear in mind, the context here is this idea of all in. This is about a commitment-based love. Are you with me? God's covenant. His promise to Abraham is offspring and land. Offspring as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the shore. Abraham's part of the covenant, 100% obedience to God, which, by the way, he was as incapable of fulfilling as you and I are because he was a sinful man just as you and I. And by the way, when a covenant is initiated by the greater, you don't negotiate the terms. It's not like Abraham said, 100% obedience, God, oh, I've already blown that. Well, would you take 80%? And actually, God, as I really honestly look at my life, would 40% cut it? <laughs> you, don't, you don't negotiate the terms of a covenant with the greater. So, in one of those stories that you really don't get, you kind of read it and go, huh, and you just move on, unless you understand the culture behind it. God tells Abraham, said, Abraham, get me a heifer, get me a ram, get me a goat, get me a turtle dove, and get me a pigeon. Three animals, two birds, and line them up. Heifer, ram, goat, line up these birds and get your chainsaw out, Abraham, because they had chainsaws back then. Okay. And he said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take those animals and those birds and cut them head to toe right down the middle. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to take the heifer. I want you to lay the sides of the carcass out. And then the ram. And then the goat and the birds. Just lay them out opposing each other. Can you see the image here? Half the animal here. Half the animal here. Now, what do you think is going to form in the middle of all that? A pool of blood. And you see, when a covenant was made, and it's still this way in some Middle Eastern cultures, when a significant covenant was going to be made, sale of land, a marriage, or something else demanding a solemn oath, that person who initiated the covenant, they would step into the blood, and they would say to the other person, okay, here's my t terms of the covenant. I promise I'll do this and this and this and this, and if I fail to live up to my terms of the covenant, you may hunt me down Kill me, and you may walk in my blood. And then that person got out, and it was the next person's turn. They got in, and they said the same thing. Now, if we had a blood path covenant before people got married, do you think the divorce rate would drop just a little? <laughs> See what I mean about a covenant being deeper than a contract? It's deep stuff, friends. And in this story, Abraham falls asleep. And, he's, and as he's dreaming, two things pass pass through the, the blood path. They, essentially, they walk through the blood. And here's what we read in Genesis 15, just two verses, verses 17 and 18. Verse 17 says, After the sun went down and darkness fell, Abram saw a smoking fire pot, that's the first thing, and a flaming torch, that's the second thing, pass between the halves of the carcasses. So the Lord made a covenant with Abram that day and said, I have given this land to your descendants. Now notice something in this covenant what passes through the blood path? The first is a smoking fire pot. Ask any Hebrew person back then. What, what did smoke represent in the life of Israel? They would have said without hesitation. Well, it represents God. When God appeared to Moses on the top of Mount Sinai to give the Ten Commandments, the entire mountain was covered in smoke. Everybody knew that smoke was a symbol of God's presence. So God, in this dream, symbolically says to Abraham, Abraham, I'm the first one in the blood. I'm the one who's inaugurating and initiating the covenant. And if I fail to live up to my part of the agreement, to give you descendants in land, to make your name great in the earth, you may hunt me down 
kill me and walk in my blood. But what happened next in this dream is absolutely mind-blowing. And the Hebrew people would have caught it. Because the next symbol Abraham sees in, his, in this dream, the next thing that passes through the blood is a flaming torch. Now again, ask any Hebrew person back then, what did fire represent to God's people? They would have said, it's a clear symbol of God. How did God appear to Moses? In a flame, a burning bush that was not consumed. How did God lead Israel through the 40 years of wilderness? A cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Which, of course, raises a kind of disequilibrium. You go, well, wait a minute. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Didn't God already pass through the blood path? Didn't God already make his covenant, his promise? The answer is yes. But God knew that if Abraham so much as stuck his toe in that blood path, Abraham would have died instantly. Because Abraham, in a thousand ways, had already broken the covenant. And he had no capacity to live up to it. And so God in this covenant does the unthinkable. God enters the blood path a second time. And in so doing, he says to Abraham, Abraham, if I do not live up to my part of the agreement, you can hunt me down, kill me, and walk in my blood. And Abraham, if you don't live up to your part of the covenant, 100% obedience, you can hunt me down, kill me, and walk in my blood. Either case, God is saying, I am all in on this covenant. If I break it or you break it, either way, I pay. Now you have to fast forward in the Gospels and come with me to a hill called Golgotha in a cross. Where Jesus God in the flesh hung there bleeding, blood running from his wrists, from his feet, from his side when they pierced him, running down his body, running down the cross, forming what at the base of the cross? A pool of blood. And it was that day that God fulfilled his promise to Abraham. On that day, human beings, quite literally, hunted down God, killed him, and walked in his blood to pay the penalty for our sin. I want you to think in a fresh way now of the words of Jesus. Shortly before he died, when he gathered with his disciples, and this again, this is a covenant, friends. In fact, it's referred to as the new covenant, and again, the covenant has outward symbols. I hope that you understand when you come in the future to receive communion, the bread, the juice, are an outward sign of an inner covenant of the heart. In Luke chapter 22, verse 20, Jesus says this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, the descendants of Abraham. It is an agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. And that, friends, that's why when we started the series, Paul, the Apostle Paul talked about how a right standing has come to us from God. The right standing, the righteousness that we have is because Jesus' death on the cross paid the penalty for the covenant that we broke. And so the church at its core is the new covenant people, saved by God, ransomed by God, redeemed by God, and called by God to bring hope and forgiveness and salvation to a messed up world. And our God, who is all in, is asking us, are you? God is asking us, will you join me? Will you join with my people to bring salvation and healing and restoration to a lost world? That, friends, is a question you cannot ask just by responding with words. You're going to respond by the actions of your life because, as we all know, talk is cheap. This is about getting off the ledge and jumping in with your life. And so, as we think about this language of covenant I want you to think for some of, uh, of you what that next step is. One of the reasons that we 
believe in membership around here is not membership gets you special status before God. It's, it's simply a way of us responding and saying, I am in. Let me give you, I think, the biggest reason uh, that being in a covenantal relationship with a local community of believers, whether it's this church or another church in town or some church somewhere, why it is so critically important. There are lots of compelling reasons, but I think the biggest reason, quite honestly, is it's biblical. Now, in saying that, there is not a proof text that you can look up in the New Testament that says, thou shalt be a member of a local congregation. But they didn't need to write that. To not be in covenantal relationship in that culture was unthinkable. Now, I've, I've, I've read these verses many times, but I want to bring up a list of what I call one another statements. I think this is significant. And um, I'm just going to breeze through them. John 13, Jesus said, love one another. In Romans 12, there's three statements. Be devoted to one another, honor one another, live in harmony with one another. Two statements in Romans 15, accept one another, instruct one another. 1 Corinthians 1, agree with one another. Galatians 5, serve one another. Ephesians 4, there's two of them, bear with one another. Actually, that verse also says that we're to forgive one another. Verse 32, be kind and compassionate to one another. Ephesians 5, submit to one another. 1 Thessalonians 5 and Hebrews 3, encourage one another. 1 Peter 3, live in harmony with one another. James 5, pray for one another. Now, every one of those one another statements are written to who? They're written to you and me as followers of Jesus. Here's another question. How many of those one another statements can you live out on your own? Answer, zero. When we were preparing this message, Joe Horn has shared with me a story being a sports guy. I loved it, and I thought it had application. It had to do with a, with a, uh, with a, a soccer match between two of the national teams in Brazil. And in Brazil, soccer is not just their natural sport. That's their, that's their national religion. They're nuts about soccer over there. Well, the star player for one of the national teams by the name of uh, the team is called Gremio, but their star player was Bruno Baltazar. Bruno Baltazar was a goal-scoring machine. He played the forward position, and in one move, he split two defenders. He took a crossing pass, and if you know anything about soccer, you can take the ball off the chest. It's called a trap, but you, you, know, you don't chest bump it. You kind of collapse your chest, so the ball just falls down. So he, he traps it off his chest. The ball drops to his left foot before it hits the ground. He flicks it with his left foot, and in one motion... Boom, he unleashes a laser shot into the upper left corner of the goal to win the game. Very dramatic. And, uh, but but here, here's the question. What part of Baltazar's body was non-essential for performing the game-winning goal? Think about it for a moment. He had to use his head to, to conceive of the play. Oftentimes in soccer, you do use your head to, you know, to head a shot. He used his torso to trap the ball. He had to use his arms to run to it. He had to use his legs to hold himself up. He used his left foot. He used his right foot. He used the whole body. His whole body was necessary for him to accomplish that. But that's, but that's on the micro level. You know, you know who else's body Baltazar depended on? Every body, including the goalie, his goalie at the other end. It was this goalie who threw the ball out, because goalies can use a hand, threw the ball out to a defender who advanced the ball up to the midfielder. The midfielder threw the ball across field deep into the offensive zone where one of the forwards ran it down. And it was that forward who sent the crossing pass to Baltazar who scored the goal. It's a team effort, friends. It's always a team effort. In the Bible, it's community, community, community. And we're talking about a covenant community. And so it is with us, friends. The church, the church capital C, the church small c, this church and all churches depends on people saying, I am all in. You can count on me, and I need to know that I can count on you. I want you to think about this at a very practical level as we think about covenantal relationships, it, like marriage, or covenantal relationships in the context of a local church with all of its flaws and all of its foibles, because people don't want to commit until they can find the what? The perfect church where the pastor doesn't wipe out or, you know, or say stupid things or uh, people are always nice and they, they, they're never rude and we're all fully sanctified. Good luck finding that, by the way. But there's one church in Traverse City, only one church. That's the church that loves Jesus. Amen? Now, there's over 100 church families. We call them congregations. 
So I want to share two verses with you to help make this really practical. In 1 Peter 5, Peter was one of Jesus' disciples. He wrote a couple letters. 1 Peter chapter 5, he says elders. Now these are, these are leaders in the church, kind of a collective group of people that oversaw the spiritual health of the church. He said, elders, care for the flock God has what? Entrusted to you. Okay? Next verse is Hebrews chapter 13. We don't know who wrote that book, but whoever wrote it, He's talking to basically the congregation, and he said, remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you, consider the outcome of their way of life, and imitate their faith. So in light of these two commands, and their commands, how do you know who your spiritual leaders are, and how do the spiritual leaders know who it is that God is going to hold them accountable for shepherding? The answer? Membership. Not in a legalistic sign your name on a piece of paper and then that's it. Membership, rightly understood, is a kind of covenant. It's a covenant of the heart. And if you sign a piece of paper and it's framed on your wall, that's the outward symbol. That's not the covenant itself. Or maybe we give you, I don't know, we give you a band or we give you, I don't know what we give you. Do we give members any? I don't know if we give you anything or not, but we probably should. It's an outward reminder that you're part of this family. There are other compelling reasons why I think membership is important, actually, very practical. Number one, you know one thing for me, about being part of something where I'm, I'm in an accountable relationship, it helps deliver me from a me-centered life because it's not all about me. It's about God and his kingdom. I think one of the benefits of membership is that the people, members are the ones who give the most, serve the most, love the most, sacrifice the most. And in the strange economy of God, Jesus said, when you give, it's given back onto you. One of the benefits of membership is members receive the most because they give the most. And I, I think membership is important because it just causes people to hang in there through those white water moments when life gets hard. And it happens every now and again. Let me talk about one other kind of covenant, and then we'll be done. It's baptism. Baptism is a covenant. The outward sign is the water. Sometimes I wish we'd baptize in ink. because We looked like Smurfs if it was blue, but we would remember better. Water is an outward sign of an inner washing. And in a few short days, we're going to head down to the bay. We've got a picture, I think, of somebody who was baptized. Some of us are going to head down to the water, and we're going to make a covenant. We're going public. We're, we're coming out. And in, in, in the act of public baptism, we are saying, I publicly identify myself with Jesus. But it's not just Jesus that I choose to identify myself with. I, I choose to identify myself with his people, with his priorities, with his principles. Because I want to make a splash in my life, and I can't make a big splash on my own. I need everybody. I want to be part of something great. I want to see people's worlds get rocked where they, where they experience grace and mercy and forgiveness through Jesus. I want to be a part of something where marriages grow strong and deep, where broken, messed up relationships get healed. I want to be part of, of something where addictions get you know, broken and where hope uh, trumps hopelessness. And we can be the hands and feet of Jesus, not just in our community, but globally as well. But at the heart of baptism is a covenant. It's a statement that says to God, to each other, and to a non-believing world, I belong to Jesus and I want to be a part of something huge, something that changes people's lives. I want to be a part of everybody. So if you've given your life to Jesus, and I mentioned this earlier, if you've not been baptized, that's not a suggestion, that's not a good idea, that's a command. I know the water's cold. That's, it's not Lake Superior, that's right. And so what if your makeup runs? Who cares? One of the most moving moments, I'll remember this my whole life, but a woman who was part of this church was undergoing cancer treatment. And she's a beautiful woman and always immaculately groomed. And she went down to the water and before she was baptized, she took her wig off. It, it wrecked me. Because in that moment, 
she was making a very profound statement. I care more about what Jesus thinks of me than what anybody else thinks. And then here's the other part. Nobody cared. In fact, I think it moved all of us who were there and saw it. So maybe, maybe a next step for you to say I'm all in is to pick up the baptism packet. For others of you, like membership is way too soon. You're like brand new. You don't even know us yet. You don't know if you even like us. That's okay. You, you know, take some time. Maybe a next step for you would be to find somebody that you know and trust and begin a serious spiritual conversation about, so what does it really mean to follow Jesus? What does that mean? I, 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 don't, I don't get that. Maybe that would be a great next step for you. Maybe for some of you, a next step to, of jumping in is to join a small group small group of 8 or 10 or 12 people who get together a couple times a month to study the Bible or talk about marriage and family or to hang out and, 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 and develop closer spiritual friends. Maybe it's to serve on a team. Maybe it's to dial into your family, to get your family spiritually and relationally on track. Maybe that would be a good next step. For some of us, the next step is to start honoring God as the Bible calls us to in our giving. To say, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you Lord of my finances. But for a whole bunch of us, it's time to say, I'm in. Some of you have been worshiping here for six months, a year, two, three years. Now is a fantastic time for you to say, I'm going to make a covenant with this church. And if this is not the church for you, that's okay. Then I would urge you to find a church where you can get into covenant relationship with them. So for many of you, you know, if you've not started the membership process, we still have books back there. I'd grab them. We have a celebration coming up on July the 13th for those who decide to actually become members of the church. And I hope a whole bunch of you will head to the hub and say I'm in for baptism. So next week, Carl Medeiros is going to be here to start off a series called I Have an App for That. It's going to be an amazing service. I hope that you will bring your friends. But let me, why don't we stand for closing prayer and then I'll, I'll let you guys go. Well, Father, thank you so much that you are God who makes radical commitments to us. Thank you that you walked, that uh, you entered into that blood covenant. Thank you, you that you were willing to pay the price for us. And now, God, I pray for those of us who understand this, that out of deep, deep gratitude, we would jump in, whatever that means. That we would trust you more. We would serve you better. We would perhaps reprioritize prioritize our time, even our finances, and that we would just open our hearts and say, God, I really do want to allow you to live your life in and through me so that like King David, I can fulfill your purposes in my generation. Help us to do that, we pray. And everybody who agreed said, amen.